in the digital age, where information flows freely and boundaries blur, the sanctity of privacy becomes all the more imperative. Honorable Dr. Justice A.K. Jayashankar and Nambiar graduated with first rank and N. Govinda Menon Memorial Gold Medal from NG University. He is a distinguished alumnus of the Oxford University where he earned his master's degree in law. Honorable Dr. Justice Nambiar's inclination towards academics is evidenced by the fact that despite his busy schedule, he obtained his doctoral degree in constitutional law from OP Jindal Global Law University in the year 2023, an institution of national eminence. Having started his legal practice in the year 1990, Honorable Dr. Justice Nambiar's dedication and commitment earned him the coveted senior gown of the Kerala High Court in July 2011. He was elevated to the bench as the additional judge of the High Court of Kerala on the 23rd of January 2014 and was confirmed as the permanent judge on the 10th of March 2016. We have amongst us a stalwart in the domain who I'm sure is going to take us through the intricacies of the topic. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Preeta S., Director, School of Legal Studies, QSAT, for the welcome address.
good lady here who said very kind things about me. So, uh, this is going to be an interactive session. Uh, and it is going to be that. Uh, so, be prepared uh, to come up with suggestions. This is a novel uh, initiative that was uh, undertaken by the Indian Law Institute. And we have Mr. Vibhushan here, who is the brain behind all of this. Uh, we thought, we, we normally organize programs in the High Court. And uh, we found that the, the reception uh, was not to our satisfaction. In the sense, the participation of the lawyers, which would be expected would be coming in large numbers to actually listen to academic uh, discussions and debates because uh, they don't have the time to do research on their own. They're running around from court to court. We thought this might be a way of, you know, infusing some kind of, uh, uh, you know, like, no, no. Is, is this okay? So, we thought we should uh, focus on uh, educational institutions, and here we are. Uh, but for reasons which are not very clear to me, uh, I have been chosen as the first speaker for this venture. Uh, I suspect this is something to do with some uh, conspiracy happening behind my back. Uh, I don't see myself lecturing to people, although I love it. I, I often go to the Nuals and engage with the students there. I like to engage with the students on topics like this because I don't want I don't want this to be a kind of monologue where I say something about uh, the, you know privacy in this case because I believe that uh, I may not be the repository of knowledge in these matters. There are your know, students. I like to see myself as a student of the law, and there's always ideas because you see there's no absolute truth in law. There's only a perspective. What you see is only a perspective. What you hear is only your opinion. There's never an absolute truth in law. And that is something that you need to keep in your mind as students. It's because whenever you have a new idea or a different way of looking at things, a critical approach to, uh, to any problem, you should air it. And it's, uh, the title is The Horizon of Privacy and Self-Determination in Indian Social Order. There are two things that strike out there. One is, of course, the concept of privacy which we have placed in our constitution or we have traced it to our constitution. But the second important thing there is we are talking about a horizon, which means you are looking at the future of the developed law of privacy in our country. So where do we see that uh, concept say five years or ten years from now. These are the two uh, things that will be engaging us today. Now, to understand the future of a concept, especially a constitutional concept, I think it's important to understand what or how the constitution itself evolved and what the constitution uh, meant to the uh, to the citizens of this country way back in 1950 when it was adopted. So I want to hear from you first of all. What was the state of our nation in 1947? When we liberated ourselves from the colonial masters from England and we became a new society overnight till 14th of August we were slaves. 15th of August we became free people. But what, what was happening in society then? Did it make a big difference in society? No, it didn't. Why do you say it didn't? In what, in what way did it not make a difference? What were the aspirations of the Indian people at the time when we got into them? What did we want most? Come on, it can be, you, you, can sound, you can say something nonsense. 
we have to listen to it. You've got a very captive audience. Nobody's going to run out of here. Yes. Good, good. That, yeah, you're partly right. Any other thoughts? Basically, even the photographer is talking. Good. <laughs> Equality in every sense, yes. Mm -hmm. Social, economic, political, yes. The ultimate power of the people uh, must, uh, the ultimate power must rest with the people. Right? Yeah. Did we get all that in 1947, 15th August? We didn't. Okay. Now, what happened to you? Some people mentioning here about the government and we wanted to elect our own leaders. Did you? Till between 1947 and 1950? Yeah. Or 51? Yeah. You didn't. So, when you're talking about a concept which is rooted in the constitution of India, you must understand what was the position in India between 1947 and 1950, when we actually adopted the constitution. Now, in 1947, we surely we got our independence, but immediately the just before that, in fact, we started our work on uh, drafting the constitution. And it took a good, uh, almost three years, two years and more. And when we finally got uh, the, the document that we wanted, and it is after enormous debates. How many of you have seen the constitutional assembly debates? How many of you, I asked the question, how many of you have seen the constitution? Ah, that's encouraging actually. So I, I should be leaving a sigh of relief. Now, how many of you have actually read some of it? Good. Good. I would seriously recommend at least a glance uh, when you read any article of the Constitution. Please go back to the Constitutional Assembly debates and read something about that article uh, as it was discussed. The numbers of the articles will be different because of the draft uh, constitution it is different. But when you do read it, you get a sense of what the feeling in the society then was. Right? And it's important for the subject that we're discussing today, uh, which is privacy. But before we get to that, 1947 to 1950, the constituent assembly itself was functioning as the first parliament. So we had governance during the morning session, we had the drafting happening in the afternoon sessions. And this was how the country was led for about two years. Now the magic that happened is, we needed to find, uh, why are we looking for a constitution? Why does any country look for a constitution? Why do you need a constitution? Do you need a constitution for that? Because we have a coded format of the rights and duties. Do you need a constitution for that? <coughs> Rule of? We have a rule of law and Do we need a constitution for that? <laughs> you heard about the might of the British Empire? Yeah. They don't have a constitution. So why do we need a constitution? Does that need to be written? Yes, sir. Why? 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 You you're getting close to that. Sir, uh, only does the skeleton can the other legislation hold. So there should be a means. There should be a foundation. That's I think that would be the purpose of the constitution. So what do you get by codifying this and writing it in the constitution? How does that help? If it's not written, 
a lot of the scope of the rights will be with the judiciary because they will determine what the scope of the rights that we have. And the last time I checked, there's still a lot of scope within the judiciary. And that's still there, but still within the framework of the Constitution, I hope. So, why in the Constitution is it a bit of fragility, right? Because in, even if you look at the British, uh, British, uh, they don't have a codified constitution. It was mostly from precedents and from judgments, right? So we are codifying it to give some pair of uh, legitimacy. is got nothing to do with codification. Rigidity. 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 Okay. Then you would, uh, it would follow that there would be no provision for amending the constitution. So that is why Indian constitution is special because it is neither to the nor to the Correct. So, back to our first, first question. <laughs> Why do we need the Constitution? See, it's always safe because I, I wanted you to think on that because the Constitution, unlike what most people think, is not for the lawyers or the legal community. The Constitution is first and foremost. Uh, Randall Austin wrote the, the treaties on our Constitution. Um, have, you, have you read that book by Randall Austin? Anybody read Randall Austin? Constitution, Indian Constitution, cornerstone of a nation. Please read it. After you after you touch upon the Constitution and Assembly debates, read Randall Austin, the Indian Constitution, cornerstone of a nation. He come out with a book later on, which says well, uh, working of a democratic constitution. That is the second book, but I would seriously commend the first book for your reading because that is where the history behind the Constitution making. It is a treatise, it is referred by all in sundry, it is, you will find it in all the uh, major landmark decisions of the constitution written by the Supreme Court. It is a must read for students of constitutional law. Please read it. But the point is, he, he begins his book by saying one fundamental thing. And he says that the Indian constitution is not a legal document. It is first and foremost a social document. So the constitution is something that a society can look to as a reference document to see what? To see whether the state, which is all powerful, is exceeding its limits, keeping the state within its bounds, keeping a check on all its actions to the extent that they affect the people who are the governed. Now the state, the concept of state that we chose to follow. What is this uh, concept of state? Why do we, why do we, what do we mean by the state? It's a political, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question that is normally asked to students in political science, but it's equally applicable to lawyers. What do you mean by this concept of a state? You see, the when you're talking about a society which is, say, the size of this room and the number of people in this room, imagine yourselves in a, in a land, in a territory, uh, which has a landmass and also a lot of, you know, preserved forests with animals and, you know, all sorts of dangers, attendant dangers. When you decide to form yourself into a society, because you're all free men and women, you can do whatever you want. But does that help you coexist? Because somewhere there's going to be dangers coming in from the forest. There could be people invading from other lands. So, when you're confronted with issues like that, which have an impact on your survival, what would, what would be the first thing that you decide to do? Because everybody can look after themselves, but will that be sufficient to maintain that society? The answer is no. So, Earliest societies had this system of give and take. You would look at the person who's strong and who's you know who's well built to protect you from animals. You look for the hunter to look at uh, to protect you from the animals. You look at the warrior to protect you from invaders. You would look at uh, the farmer to you know till the soil because it's, some people come with specialized knowledge, so you you need them as well. So you start arranging your affairs in such a way that somebody is doing something. Now that person needs to be compensated, so he, what do you do? You have to give up some part of your rights. If you start thinking only about yourself, and everybody starts thinking only about himself or herself, you never have a coexistence in society. 
So you start thinking of giving up something. And this is the concept that grew into this philosophical imagination by Thomas Hobbes. It's called Leviathan. You remember, does that ring a bell for anybody? Yeah. So, Leviathan is this concept, this is imaginary, a cloud-like form, where, which is formed from the sacrificing or by the relinquishment of individual freedoms by individuals in society. So each of you relinquish a part of your freedoms and give it to the sovereign. Now initially this Leviathan was a sovereign and which meant a king. Now there was an advantage of having a king as the head of the society because you know he was all powerful and his power was derived from the people he governed. So the people gave up some of their powers to enrich or empower their king. And the king would be the defense of the realm. He would also be you know, uh, responsible for providing or feeding the people. Everything fell within him. And that's the famous uh, quote that you get from Louis XIV uh, in France, who says, uh, in French it is, uh, let us say moi. In English it is translated, I am the state and the state is me. So, I am you know, I'm the king and I am France and France is me. This is what he said famously or infamously. But that concept soon gave way because not every monarch, not every king is as powerful uh, as maybe the one you had experienced with. Now, succession in the, on the throne normally happens through the family. Now, it's not a certainty that a king's son is going to be as valiant or uh, uh, strong as he is. So this concept of state soon started withering and you now have a concept of state as we know it, which is uh, a body that is entrusted with the task of legislation, a body that is entrusted with the task of implementing and a body that is called in like us wherever there is a dispute. So that's broadly how you have uh, the legislature executive and judiciary coming in. Now why am I saying all this in the context of what we are discussing here today? You must understand that privacy as a concept is rooted in the concept of liberty. So liberty means your freedom to do anything you want. And as I just pointed out, you cannot have a complete or absolute liberty to do what you want in a society that is governed by the rule of law. So in a society, when you are dependent upon others, then you must recognize that there is something that you have to give up for getting other benefits which the state has to offer. That is why even today, privacy as a concept is never talked about in absolute terms because it is, you cannot have an absolute privacy just as you cannot have absolute liberty. Right? Keep that in your mind because the, 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 the development of the law that you see in India as, as elsewhere will always tell you that you can never have an absolute right in a democracy set up governed by the rule of law. So what exactly do we mean by privacy? What is the nature of privacy? Any ideas? Everybody says, you know, I, I want my privacy. What do you mean? Yes, photographer. <laughs> what do you mean by privacy? Uh, what is your understanding of privacy? So, like, I get an individual to have a private mind. Exactly. Any other ideas? You need a personal space, right? You need a private space to do whatever you want. At least that limited space where you're not in public gaze, where people don't pry, people don't look. Uh, do you see that happening in, uh, in Kerala at any time? <laughs> Have you ever had a neighbor who's like, no, I don't want anything to do with these people, I'll leave them alone. You wish. You never get it, do you? One 
maid servant from the next house coming into your house, 15 minutes, she knows your entire horoscope. <laughs> Isn't it? That's, that's the land in which we are talking about privacy. So please understand, this, this privacy as an absolute concept was something that our constitution framers never dared to embrace. Because the privacy as the Englishman knows, or the privacy as the American knows, is not the privacy that we know. For us, privacy means, you know, keeping everybody away. The right to be forgotten. Where on earth is this going to happen? It's never going to happen in, in, in India. So, we knew this. Our constitution drafters knew this. And they said, at the time when the uh, constitution was being drafted, there were many who said that maybe we should have a, uh, a privacy as a fundamental right. The privacy they were referring to was the security of the home, protection of the home. So within, you know, uh, basically protection against arbitrary state action which involves interference with your home and your personal space. This was the privacy that they were talking about. Pretty much what was happening in America. In America also, the law of privacy is developed along those channels, which is protecting the home and the personal space at home. Right? Europe. A slightly different thing, but I'll come to that in a minute. So, when the constitution was being drafted, you had our principal constitutional advisor, B. N. Rao. He had flown to America because at that time we were we were looking heavily to the uh, or looking to the United States for giving us some inspiration with regard to what we should put into our constitution. You must realize that it's about the roughly the same time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights happened uh, after the Second World War. So 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This was the backdrop in which we had the Constitution drafted. So it was it was it was clear that we must have a charter, we must have a, uh, a set of rights, fundamental rights, which we would entrench in our Constitution, which would not be meddled or fiddled around by anybody, including the state. So. There had to be certain deliberation as to what would those rights be. Because if you are going to put it in part 3, you can't touch it thereafter. So you have to be very careful as to what you would put because the constitution is to endure for uh, ages. It can't be a document which just stays for about a year or two. So there was a lot of thought and you will find that in the discussions in the constitution assembly debates on fundamental rights. It, it, it goes to a sizable uh, number of pages. In uh, in Granville Austin's book, you would find a condensed version, but that that itself goes into about uh, 90 to 100 pages. But it's an interesting read because you will understand what uh, weighed with the uh, drafters when they were bringing about this fundamental rights chapter. But crucially, what happened was when B. M. Rao went to United States, he met with Felix Frankfurter, who was a U.S. Supreme Court judge. Now in America, what was happening during that time was that between 1897-1937, those were those were the uh, that was the period when in America you had a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, uh, innovative uh, legislations being drafted by the legislature there, which was being attacked by the citizenry in courts, saying that this affected our liberty, <coughs> citizens liberty. Now America is known as the land of the free, you have the statue of liberty, it must mean something. And that means that you know liberty is kept at a very high pedestal in America. And they are very touchy about it, anybody tries to interfere with their liberty, you know they come down very heavily. And the courts were doing all that they could to protect it. So all these social welfare legislations as it were, they call it the New Deal legislation. They were being struck down by the courts. And this is what in America has become known as the Lochner era because it takes, uh, it takes uh, its name after the famous case which is Lochner versus New York. So, the experience that they got from the Lochner era, which is when you know, citizens would come up and oppose any legislation which had even a propensity to affect their 
privileges. Simple things like uh, if you, uh, you know, if, if women were working in a, in a bar, for example, a legislation that comes in saying that women cannot work in the bar after, you know, seven, uh, seven in the evening, immediately struck down. We should be able to do what we want. And this was upheld by the courts during the lockdown era. So that the experience that the Americans had, where every effort at social welfare legislation was being thwarted, which was being struck down by the judiciary, was very heavy in the mind of, uh, of Justice Frankfurter. And he told D.N. Rao the same thing. Now imagine your country, which is just getting freedom from the colonial powers. If you put in a doctrine of privacy, or in, in, uh, put in a right to privacy in, as a fundamental right, every legislation that is enacted by you is going to be struck down on that very ground. So, B.N. Rao comes back armed with this knowledge and he says there's a point. Please don't introduce privacy as a fundamental right. And therefore it was never in the constitution. Two things were not in the constitution. One is privacy and the second is substantive due process. Right? So, these two things were never inserted into the constitution only because of the fear that recognition of those things as a fundamental right would hamper legislation would hamper advancement or development of society and we were not an egalitarian society. We had a huge divide between the rich and the poor, we had a huge divide in terms of caste, we had a huge divide in terms of social status. So all these things that have to be leveled, you cannot afford to have somebody complaining about this. And we realized this in the very first year. As I said, Leave aside privacy, we had a lot of fundamental rights which were entrenched in our constitution in 1950 when the constitution saw. You all know Article 31, you had a fundamental right to property, right? And what happened? The challenge, because it gets very interesting for those of you who want to do intense reading on the first amendment to the constitution dealing with uh, fundamental rights. There's an excellent book by, uh, by an author called Tribur Dhawan Singh. It's called 16 Stormy Days. And it deals entirely with the, with the, uh, the uh, efforts of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru to bring about a change in the constitution so that he can get rid of this fundamental right to property, which he ultimately succeeded in doing and it became a, a constitutional right under 300 a But the reason why that was such an eyesore for him, or it was a nagging point for him, was, can you imagine a, a, a society which takes shape in 1947, a free society, and the first and foremost thing in the social agenda is social reforms for the government. They want to bring about social reforms. Land to the landless. Who has the land? The landlords, the zamindars, the landless are the peasants, the laborers. If you want to take land from the zamindars and give it to the landless, how do you do that without taking the land or buying the land from the landlord? So long as Article 31 is there. Article 31 said no person can be deprived of his property except without, except after payment of due compensation, just compensation. Now that is fine. It's, it's a fine principle that you can take property from someone only after giving him just compensation. Except that the government of the day did not have the money to pay the farmers, uh, to the landlords. So how do you do this now? You want to push, for, uh, push forward the social reforms agenda. You want to make it an equitable society. You want to uh, take from the person who have the land and give it to the person who don't have the land. You have to buy it from the person who has the land. I don't have the money. The government does not have the money to buy it. And this, when the government started attempting devious methods of taking the land by giving uh, not the market value or not even a just or reasonable compensation, the landlords went to court. And all the 
legislation which provided for taking or acquisition of land without proper compensation was struck down by the various high courts. And this is when you get the first uh, <coughs> uh, Shankari Prasad and the line of cases. And what did the Supreme Court do when the challenge came? When Shankari Prasad was uh, uh, came to the Supreme Court and they challenged the first amendment to the constitution which took away this fundamental right. You see, you have something magical in our constitution called Article 13. And Article 13 too says, the state shall not make any law that takes away or abridges any of the rights conferred under this part, part meaning part 3. So, when an amendment is made to the constitution, the amendment is by an amendment act, which is a law made by parliament. The amendment act has the effect of amending the constitution to take away a right and a fundamental right. I would have thought that without anything more, Article 32 should have been enough to strike down that whole amendment. But we did not do that. And this is where law becomes politics, if you, uh, which is what the critical uh, legal studies tells us. Critical legal studies is an approach to studying the law, understanding the law, which says that look at law through critical lens to understand what is it that the law is really trying to do. Is it trying to espouse the views of a particular lobby or a, or a, or a community or a particular group of persons? According to them, law is always the result of a power struggle and the ones who have power manage to get the law in their favour. But let's not go that far, I mean, let's not look, think so deviously. When you actually look at it, it's a good thing that happened that the uh, amendment was actually uh, upheld. Because were it not for that amendment, the social agenda, reforms agenda would not have proceeded today. And we all agree today that it was a good thing that, that, uh, that the egalitarian distribution of land happened. But the Supreme Court dealt with it in a particular way. I'll come to that in a bit. But this, this was what was happening on the ground when it came to a newly enacted constitution. The very first year of its enactment or adoption, we had the First Amendment. Now, when you're faced with that situation, we have fundamental right to equality. Now, imagine you're in 1950. You have equality. You have uh, fraternity, you have liberties. Was it was it possible for somebody to go to court and say, look, look, I'm an equal. I, I need to be treated equally. I need college admissions. I need, you know, you can't segregate me. Uh, I belong to such and such caste. The the wealthy landlord belongs to another caste. He is not preventing me. Uh, he is preventing me from getting certain benefits. You can't do that. Give me my right. Uphold my fundamental rights. Could anybody have done that in 1950? No. So our constitution did not envisage the full play of fundamental rights the next day. It was supposed to be done incrementally, in stages, as society evolved. And there is no clearer expression or manifestation of this idea than the very next chapter, which is the directive principles of state policy. So you have fundamental rights you have directive principles of state policy. Now you open your constitution and hopefully you do have a constitution. <laughs> if you look at part 3 and part 4, I'll just take it to one or two articles just to try home the point. You see, Thirty-eight or thirty-nine. Certain principles of policy to be followed by the state. The state shall, in particular, direct its policy towards securing that the citizens, men and women, equally have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. It's basically the equality clause with Article Twenty-One. This 
is mentioned in Article 39, which is the directive principles of state policy. If it was already covered by Article 14 and 19 and 14 and 14 and 21, where to take effect from the very next day, why would you have it in the directive principles of state policy? Because directive principles of state policy, the chapter itself says, are not enforceable in court. Right? So, similarly, that the ownership and control of material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. Again, we are talking about economic e uh, uh, equality or economic justice. You have that already ingrained in the constitution in Article 14. Why is it again facing in 39? So, if you look at this, compare with the fundamental rights and uniform civil code, <coughs> it is mentioned in the directive principles of state policy. Why? Because it was not agreed. It was there was uh, there was considerable the discord as to whether we should have a uniform civil code when we enacted the constitution. So they left that apart. They they pushed it for debate in future. And when I say debate in future, please understand what the constitution drafters meant was a debate by future parliaments, right? Not by future divisions. They meant future parliaments. Because I, 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 I say this to you because you're all students of law and I've seen umpteen judgments of the Supreme Court is also literature written by no less dignitaries and no less famous persons than Fali Nariman himself. Uh, and I had discussions with him on this point. I dread when people say that judiciary can read into the silences of the constitution. Please don't do it. There is a reason why the constitution is there. There is a reason why those silences are there. Some of those silences, please understand, are deliberate. The UCC is a case in point. There was no consensus among the people. There was no consensus among the uh, discussions in the Constitutional Assembly with regard to whether or not we should have a uh, uniform civil court. In fact, the persons who wanted it most were the women members. The ones who did not want it were the men, who were the majority. So, Curiously, in a recent debate uh, on uh, Uniform Civil Court, when the, when the views of the women who are now emancipated, like all of you here, who are now emancipated, who are more you know, uh, well-read, they express their minds. If you look at the feminist teachings today, you find that the, the general thought among feminists is that we should not have a Uniform Civil because the idea of India, they say, is lies, or the, 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 the charm of India, they say, lies in the diversity. So there's different cultures, there's different uh, uh, different cultures informing the different attires, the different behavior, the different uh, rituals practiced by women all over India. And that is the charm, that is the magic of India. So they say, please don't touch it. So today, you know, these are shifting perspectives that you find in any society. And that is why you need to have a constitution that can mold itself for any change in future. So, the directive principles were there precisely because there was no consensus at the time of adoption of the constitution with regard to what should go into part 3. So, part 3, the scheme is one of incremental empowerment of the citizenry. You need to keep that in mind because when you look at the development now of uh, the privacy, right. You will find this trajectory through and through. So let's see what happens in, um, in the countries from which we took uh, inspiration. First and foremost, we have the United States. And I told you that in the United States, the, the concept of privacy was more targeted to preventing state action which had the object or the possibility of interfering with the homes and the private lives of citizens. Please be attentive to that because what you have, what the focus is, the focus entirely was on the object of the state action. Right? So if there was, and you'll find most of those cases in the in the US which started dealing with uh, with uh, privacy, uh, deal with as uh, issues of contraception. Start with the uh, 
uh, with the uh, famous case of Griswold in Connecticut. That's in 1965. Griswold in Connecticut, what was the issue? There was a state legislation which said that if you supply contraceptives to married persons, right? If you supply contraceptives to married persons, you will be penalized. You will you be seen as committing an offence. That legislation was struck down. It said because you cannot interfere with what I I want. Bodily autonomy, right? 1965, 1972. You have Eisenstadt and Bayer. That was a decision with regard to, or that was a law, which said that you cannot distribute contraceptives to unmarried persons, right? Struck down again. They said you cannot interfere with my choice, right? So there again. Please understand that this is America where liberty is at a very, very high pedestal. So anything that has the propensity to affect the liberty of a citizen is struck down. 1973, the famous case, Roe and Wade, abortion, right? You cannot prohibit abortion unless it is for the welfare of the, uh, of the woman. You all know that case only to that. Reproductive autonomy. Affirmed subsequently in 1992 in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Again, the same logic and uh, reasoning. 2003, Lawrence in Texas, which is consensual homosexual relationships protected. Do not, do not come into my bedroom. Was the was the slogan that was shown against the president of America uh, that time, uh, George Bush the senior. And then, 2022, something completely unexpected happens. Roe and Wade is overturned. Why would that happen? 2022, any thoughts on that? I'm sure all of you heard about it, but any thoughts on why? We're talking about a country which from 1965 has been recognizing the doctrine of privacy, uh, <coughs> right to privacy and right against invasion. 2022 they come up and say the constitution does not guarantee a right to privacy. Any thoughts on that? Why the thoughts? Has anybody read that there? Yes? No? So what, what struck you most in that journey? Definitely a power back to the legislation, uh, legislation to make uh, their own. Good, good. Yeah, you are absolutely right. So what, what, what principle were they giving priority to? You are right. You are exactly right on the point. Part of it is already there in your answer. So what is this? Why only legislature should do? What do you call it? Ah, yes. So now they're giving, now they're thinking of separation of powers. So they say that you know there are certain areas which is a complete no-no for the judiciary. Do what you are specialized to do. And these are matters you must remember are matters which affect the people and the you know the the innermost spaces of the people. You cannot ignore society. You cannot ignore social morality or general common morality. So if a bulk of the or if a majority of the nation is actually thinking of abortion as anti biblical or anti religion, you cannot have the law step in and say no, it is permissible. And America as a country, although there is no formal uh, you know uh, sort of coming together of the state and religion, in fact they profess to have it separated, there's a lot of that that infiltrates into society. So the majority view, majoritarian view that this should be, uh, you know, uh, restricted or prohibited prevailed. And the judiciary was caught in a tangle because as early as in 1973, they recognized them. We, the rest of the world, hears only this story. Because that's different from what they're... You never know what they think. 
What does the society actually want? Judiciary is not in a position to say that because judiciary decides cases based on what is available before the judiciary. And you need not have recourse to all the uh, material that would inform a, uh, a judgment. So that's why they were reverted back. These matters, let it go back to the experts. And there are states in, uh, in America where the Roe and Wade principle still follows. Those are the states which permit an abortion. But that's, the, that's because the statute permits it. There are other states where you can't get it. So those are the largely uh, Catholic or Christian dominated uh, states. So, and in the digital space, Carpenter's case. Again, you, uh, the, the, this is the decision of 2018. In Carpenter's case, the, uh, you know, there was a criminal investigation going on. And like we do in most of our, uh, the first thing that an I.O. here decides is to go for your cell phone records. Because today everybody is using a cell phone. Whether it's for committing a crime or for, you know, chatting on WhatsApp. But what they do is, the investigating officer first of all finds out, does he have a cell phone in his name? Immediately pull out that number, ask the cell phone, or the uh, operator, please give me the call data records of all these uh, pertaining to this particular phone. Of course, you don't get the conversation, you only get the data regarding the call. But you get it from the operator. Same thing happened in America. Except they found that a person who was being surveilled, his uh, phone, they called for the details and they were using these details for prosecuting him. The court said you cannot use that information because you do not have a warrant for getting this information. And this is information that is that is confidential in nature as far as the user is concerned. Now this is because in America, unlike in India, they still follow the rules of fruits of the forbidden tree. So if you if you, it's not uh, in India as long as you get the evidence, you're fine. <laughs> in America, you got to get the evidence the right way before you <laughs> before you proceed against the, uh, a person. So they take their privacy very seriously there. So the point, the takeaway from all this as far as American law is concerned, is that American law, barring the Dobbs judgment which we saw, which is an aberration, but maybe motivated by political considerations, but barring that, the general drift is that you, you focus on the object, the object of the legislation, and if it is even designed, even though it may not actually, even designed to interfere with the privacy, of a citizen, it is struck down. So that's America. Now what happens in the Europe and in UK? It's slightly different. The focus shifts. It is no longer on, you don't look at the object of the uh, legislation. You do not look at the object of state action. You look at the effects. And what is it designed to do? You are, see, in England, they've always recognized the zone of privacy. It is there in common law. Forget the constitution, they, I mean, they don't have a written constitution, but they are informed by higher principles, which they call, which they refer to as their constitution. Of course, later point of time, they had the, uh, the initially they had the European Con Convention on Human Rights, which ultimately in Britain became the Human Rights Act in 1998. So, you, you have those legislations conferring certain rights. But, we have all that. Earliest common law itself recognized certain forms of privacy. Your your right to uh, your right to be uh, insulated from nuisance, which is even in the Indian Penal Code. In the tort law, you had various uh, uh, you know uh, trespass, for example. That's again an aspect of privacy. You 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 don't want somebody else in, uh, you know coming into your space. Criminal breach of trust in criminal law, and this, these, these rudimentary forms of privacy, which you found in common law, was what was then developed into the privacy right that we saw in future times. And uh, you know the famous case of Seaman's Seaman's case, which they call only for the, for what was said there, which is that every Englishman's house is his castle and fortress, so nobody comes in. Uh, without 
authorization without permission, without the consent of the landlord. Now, if you look at some of the cases in, in England, the first one in 1948, I'm taking those cases which pertain, which correspond to the years when our case laws also developed. Saltman Engineering, that was a case where industrial drawings, uh, confidential industrial drawings for making certain industrial dyes were handed over to somebody for making those dyes. That somebody shared it with somebody else. And that person started making the same dyes at a lesser cost. And he started marketing it. Now this was something that was, uh, that was very private for the first person who supplied the drawings because he didn't expect it to go all over the place. Building upon the breach of confidentiality uh, law, which is there very much in common law, and borrowing from the concepts of the European Convention on Human Rights, the English courts started reading it as a breach of privacy, breach of confidentiality. And then it is followed in 2004 and 2007 by two high celebrity cases. First one is Naomi Campbell. You all heard of Naomi Campbell. Or at least the boys among you must have heard of Naomi Campbell. Supermodel Naomi Campbell. She is a, uh, she's a dark woman and uh, she is advertised for almost every consumer product. She was seen coming out of a uh, uh, sort of alcoholics and the equivalent of alcoholics and anonymous for drugs. So narcotics and anonymous. She was seen coming out of a club uh, where this meeting was held, and somebody took a photograph of her and started circulating it, and uh, you know all sorts of messages uh, saying that you know uh, attributing that. You know, she's a drug addict. And the question was, was was it right for the publisher of those photographs to actually publish this? So the case was taken to the highest level. The House of Lords ultimately said it's a breach of her confidentiality. Now this is happening in two thousand in in two thousand four in England. What would you do with your WhatsApp messages? circulating here in 2024. You get ideas on how you can proceed with this? Keep that in the back of your mind because you might find handy because we've got enough in our uh, Puttasami to to help you with that line of uh, argument. The other was Douglas in 2007. Now, Douglas refers to Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas marrying Catherine Zeta-Jones. Both of you, have you heard of any of them? Good Lord! <laughs> Don't you people see movies? Here, from what I gather, you are not interested in men, you are not interested in women, you are not interested in women. What is this? And you call yourself lawyers? Okay. Uh, Michael Douglas's case was basically that uh, theirs was a celebrity wedding. Michael Douglas and Kathleen Zeta Jones, both, uh, you know, celebrity actors and actors. Actors, when they got married, um, Catherine Zeta Jones is, is known for having signed Michael Douglas, whose habits were quite, uh, uh, he was quite the randy man. Uh, she made him sign a prenup agreement. So much so that if, if he even looked at another woman, <laughs> his bank balance would fall by a couple of billions. So, that was the prenup, followed by a uh, uh, elaborate wedding that took place. Now the rights to cover that wedding photograph was conferred on a particular person. But then these, this is the age of paparazzi, so you had somebody jump the wall and he took a photo. Uh, the state had information against him which showed almost certainly that he was a decoy. Uh, but they had no evidence to nail him. So what did they do? They started a surveillance against him. And the surveillance basically included uh, archaic methods like, you know, midnight knocks on his uh, house. So he, they would come and knock at the night and say, Mr. Karak Singh, are you there? And he would say yes. 
okay, we just want to ensure that you're there. And then they would tell him wherever he went. So he was exasperated, he approached the court. He said, this is a violation of my fundamental rights under Article 19, freedom of movement, and Article 21. Now what does the majority do? Harak Singh is again uh, the majority and there's a dissenting view by Justice uh, Subarao. The majority said the Article 19 argument, uh, argument is very easy. 19 gives you freedom of movement. The surveillance doesn't prevent you from moving anywhere. Right? You can move anywhere in the country. So your liberty is not actually affected. We are only looking at you. <laughs> we are only watching you. So, how do we do that? Argument goes. 21 also did not fare any better. But the majority, strangely, said, following the American view, said that this is the, the, the aspect of privacy is an aspect of ordered liberty. So, if the state is doing something to, to go into the innermost spaces of the citizen, in this case is house. Following Semaini's case, which said that the Englishman's house is a fortress and uh, you know castle. They said this is part of ordered liberty, therefore midnight knocks, you know, avoid. So eventually it was decided in his favor, but for different reasons. The majority therefore you know put it at uh, ordered liberty. What are the minority? Uh, Subarao. Subarao says no, no, don't put it in ordered liberty. This is an integral part of his personal liberty. And you must recognize uh, an area which uh, you must recognize his dignity. So you're looking at it from the point of view of the individual. Effect on the individual. This is where the stark contrast between the US and the UK and the European cases and now India uh, is visible. The action, privacy protection in the US is by holding any law which has its object of interfering with uh, personal liberty as unconstitutional. Europe, you wait for what happens pursuant to that action. See how it affects the individual. If it, if it has an impact on the dignity of the individual, and dignity is a very wide term, if it has an effect on the dignity of the individual, then and then alone would you strike it down. Now, the cases that follow in the meanwhile, 1975 you have Gobind, almost similar facts as Karaksi, Midnight Knox, etc. There again, KK Matthew, who is the father of your new chair, Krishna Earth chair, this uh, is Kim Joseph. Uh, outstanding jurist, if you ask me. For anybody who wants uh, uh, the capsule form of administrative law as we know it today, please go and read Sukhdev Singh. Article 12, you must have read all those things. Sukhdev Singh was the state. One sentence in that judgment of K.K. Matthew encapsulates the entire administrative law that you must learn. He says, Every state action, right, the, must be informed by constitutional limitations. That's all. <laughs> the state action must be informed by constitutional limitations. This is all he says. That's your entire administrative law encapsulated in one sentence. I've never seen a better line when it comes to when it comes to administrative law. And that is the man. So what does he say in, uh, in Gobind? He draws inspiration from the American line of cases. Griswold in Connecticut, Roe and Wade, and the rest. And he follows uh, Karak Singh to find that privacy is implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. That's the majority. That's the only place where he departed from the uh, trajectory that was otherwise being followed. As you know, in Gobind, Karak Singh, uh, uh, the, the, the minority in Karak Singh, that is, uh, uh, Subarao's decision was not followed in Gobind. But that was followed later in 
Neera Mathur in LIC, which is in 1992. Uh, that was a case where LIC started demanding information from ladies who were applying for their uh, jobs and furnished personal details including their menstrual cycle, conceptions, pregnancies, I don't know what on earth for, <laughs> but at the time of their appointment. Uh, and uh, that was held to be an intrusion into the uh, right to privacy, bodily integrity, dignity. Then you have the famous Otto Shankar case, R. Raj Gopal, 1994. This is a man who wrote his autobiography inside the jail and uh, very masterfully wrote that, you know, every investigating officer, every police official, uh, they were all hand in glove with me and I, you know, I paid them money, this, that. Now, these people obviously went to the court and they said, uh, uh, this can't be published because it's going to be affecting us. So, the question was, uh, largely it was decided on facts because there was nothing to show that Otto Shankar had actually written these things and passed it on to the publisher. Uh, so, there was no proof of him having actually written anything of the sort. But even if he had, the uh, Supreme Court said that, you know, this has the propensity to, and this is half-baked material on the basis of which you cannot uh, spoil or tarnish the image of public men. So, no right, uh, the right to personal liberty according to the Supreme Court included the right to safeguard uh, privacy of a person, his family, his uh, marriage, procreation, motherhood, childbearing, education, etc. Then comes 1997 PUCL. Uh, that was again something similar to the Carpenter's case. Uh, challenged the statutory provision that uh, authorized the government to intercept messages as part of crime detection. So if you wanted to uh, intercept a message of somebody, uh, the statute provided that struck down as violative of Article 21, uh, the state action had to satisfy the test of just, fair and reasonable restriction. Then you have in 1998, Mr. X and Y Hospital. Again, uh, blood was given for testing, the person tested it, the hospital tested it and found that this person was HIV positive and they had no uh, inhibitions about making this public as well. With the result that man, uh, you know, uh, his uh, fiancee went walkies and uh, the marriage was called off. So he then sued the hospital saying that you know they had no right to do that and it was said privacy. Uh, uh, they said that uh, there is no breach of privacy. And why is that? And this is where it starts getting uh, into the area where they say that privacy is not an absolute right, which is what I started with. In a, in a society like us, you can't have a privacy as an absolute right. So, here the court says, you may have a right to privacy, but it is always subservient to superior public interest. And what is public interest? If it is a matter of public health, then the public is interested in it. And therefore, your privacy right can be curtailed to that extent, so as to promote public interest or public health. Then you have... Anuj in 2008, these are the uh, uh, girls in the premises of hotels. There was a statute which, Bombay, uh, there was a statute which said that you cannot uh, permit women to work in places where they are serving uh, alcoholic liquor. Just imagine. I see a lot of desperate faces here. <laughs> what would you do with a, with, a, with, a, with a law like that today? I think the women would be up in arms. Now, the, uh, uh, it was held that the legislation basically invades the privacy right of the individual because that is again a matter of autonomy of a person. It's a matter of choice and you can't, you can't prohibit that. NASA case in 2014, right of transgenders. Again, gender identity forms the core of one's personal identity, expression, choices, decisions pertaining to one's body, sexual orientation are part of the right to privacy. And then comes, of course, our famous Putasami, 2017. Now, Putasami says a couple of things very clearly. Uh, it formally overruled M.P. Sharma, formally, um, and Karak Singh, the majority view in Karak Singh, which was following the, Europe, uh, the American trajectory. So now we are firmly grounded now on the European trajectory. So we now look at privacy as part of the dignity. It also says that 
the individual is the focal point of the constitution. So, uh, you are looking at it from the point of view of dignity of the individual, the effect of action on the individual rights. Privacy is recognized as an inviolable, to the extent that it is recognized, it is recognized as an inviolable right. So, it's a fundamental right, yes, it's inviolable, right? Uh, it is rooted in the concept of liberty. Why is it concept of liberty? Because without privacy, without the right to choice, without the right to think differently, without the right to be left alone, you cannot exercise your freedoms properly. What? How can you exercise the freedom of movement? Imagine Karak Singh's right. He can't move freely unless you recognize the right of privacy in him. Right? So, it is rooted in the concept of liberty and it is without uh, recognizing the right to privacy, you cannot actually uh, exercise your uh, freedoms or fundamental freedoms. It is both the common law right and the fundamental right. And this is important because not everything do you need to rush to the high court. You can enforce this as a common law right. And this is where, uh, again, I would take you back to uh, the chapter on fundamental rights in Daniel Austin's book, Indian Constitution, Cornerstone of a Nation. In that, he says one thing when it comes to Articles 15, 17 and 22. He points to those articles and says there are fundamental rights are different, you know, the different fundamental rights operate differently in different circles. There are fundamental rights which the state is obliged to protect and that is an obligation of the state to protect. There are other fundamental rights which are equally enforceable against citizens, fellow citizens. So not every fundamental right violation becomes a public law remedy. You can also have a private law remedy. Uh, so those actions which are there in 15, 17 and 21, 22, you can, uh, the right against conscription that is, you can enforce even against a private individual. Uh, that's, a, that's an area which needs to be developed uh, through the now enabled common law right of privacy. So if you find a fellow citizen, your nosy neighbor, etc., looking into your house. This is one angle that you can uh, use. The um, and the last, it's that it is not an absolute right. It's a qualified one, and that must give way to overriding public interest. So, if you have overriding public interest, all this goes. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky, and this is a subject where. Uh, the students of constitutional law like you and me must actually engage. You see, when you, on the one hand you have uh, privacy being recognized as a fundamental right. It's an individual right. My understanding of a fundamental right is that to the extent it is recognized, I may stand, I may be in the minority, but the law should protect me and my interests and my right. right? So, the one uh, thread that you find running through the entire chapter on fundamental rights is an anti-majoritarian flavor or anti-majoritarian ring to it. So, if a man stands up in court and says that my fundamental right is affected, notwithstanding the fact that the entire nation stands against him, it is a duty of courts, who are the sentinel and the kuiwe, who are the guardians of fundamental rights, to uphold that right of the individual, which is the meaning given by the court when it says the fundamental rights are individual rights. If it is individual, if it is anti-majoritarian, how does it give way to overriding public interest? So that that's an area where you need to uh, apply your mind. You have the doctrine of proportionality, which is also one of the balancing exercises. So when you apply that, you uh, it's basically a threefold requirement. You look at whether the restriction through the law is something, you know, uh, is it actually by a law made by the statute, by the legislature? That's the first one. Is there a legality element? Second, you look, you ask the question as to whether there is a need for this. Is there is it a compelling state interest that there is? Is there a need to restrict it? That's the second. And the last is the balancing of uh, rights. You must have some kind of a, uh, a proportionality or some kind of a rational nexus 
between the objects and the means that you adopt for uh, uh, attaining those objects. That's the proportionality. Don't don't uh, you know kill a fly with a sledgehammer kind of argument. So that's the uh, uh, aspect of privacy. Later judgments, of course, you all know. 2008, Nathan Johar, Article 377, struck down privacy of intimate relationships and sexual privacy of a Shafi Jahan, your uh, love jihad case. And then Puttasami 2 of 2019, which is where the Aadhaar Act, that is again where they applied the proportionality test. And they said that the Aadhaar Act and requiring information from the citizenry for uh, distribution of state benefits or welfare benefits, privacy can be uh, overlooked because it is not an absolute right. And the public interest demands that certain information be collected for that purpose. Now, I, before I conclude, I, I, I just uh, I, I might take just about 15 minutes. Is that all right for you? Um, before I conclude, I just want to uh, point out two aspects. One is you will see in the trajectory of development of the right to privacy a similarity between a, uh, the, a similarity with the trajectory that fundamental rights in general have happened. For example, if you look at uh, the 1950 case of Gopal, A.K. Gopal was a state, right? You find that uh, uh, there is uh, the silos theory, you know that. Gopal was detained under a preventive detention law. He, of course, went to court and he said, this is one of the first cases. It's I think the repetition number is 13 of 1950. Whether 13 had anything to do with the ultimate result, I do not know. <laughs> but, but 13 of uh, 1950 was the case number. The uh, <coughs> Gopalan's case basically uh, was a challenge against the preventive detention law <coughs> on the ground that it again, you know, violated its fundamental rights under 19 and 21. But look how cleverly. Uh, and on a pure textual reading of the Constitution, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, gets over this. It says, you're complaining of 19, freedom of movement. Uh, freedom of movement uh, is only ancillary to Article 21. Article 21 is the larger right. It's a right to personal liberty. Freedom of movement is only an incidental part of it. If you don't have liberty, how do you move? So, uh, if Article 21 is not violated, your Article 19 is also not violated. So, is Article 21 violated? Answer, no. Why? <coughs> You've been detained under a preventive detention law. It's a statute. What does 21 say? No person should be deprived of his life or personal liberty except by a procedure established by law. Is there a law? Yes. Is there a procedure? Yes. Go pull it out, right? So that was a very simple line of reasoning followed by the Supreme Court in 1950. 1954, you come to MP Sharma. We saw that case. Correct Singh in 1963. Majority says ordered liberty. Minority says please recognize privacy. Is privacy mentioned in our constitution? No. So you are reading things into the constitution. They could have very well read it in 1950. They did not do it. Now, R.C. Cooper, 1970. What did R.C. Cooper do? R.C. Cooper was the case for the first time from after 1950, Gopalan, which said that Article 14, 1921 are all individual silos. So you look for the violation. If you are complaining about violation or infringement of Article 21, you look at what Article 21 says. The answer is procedure established by law. There is a law, there is a procedure, you are out. If it's Article 19, you look at what is your freedom. Do you have a freedom of movement? Yes. Is it restricted by 19.2? Any of the provisions in 19.2? Yes. Out. So, you know, you started looking at everything in silos, in individual compartments. R.C. Cooper, for the first time, in 1970, changed all that. R.C. Cooper said, hang on, you can't just say Article 21 says law and then leave it in there. All the rights in Part 3 are actually intermingled. The entire chapter on fundamental rights 
is woven on a fabric containing all the rights in part three. So you cannot ignore one right in favor of the other. So now you have to look at three things. If wherever there is a violation of fundamental rights or an allegation that fundamental <laughs> rights have been infringed, you look at whether it is sanctioned by a just law, substantive due process. Is it a non-discriminatory, non-arbitrary law, Article 14? Is the restriction something that is authorized by 19.2, Article 19? So you have 14, 19, 21. 21 as to whether it is a just law when you read in the substantive due process. This is how we start looking at fundamental rights. And most importantly, do not look at what the object was. Look at the effect on the individual. So the paradigm shift, the tectonic shift that you find is focus changes from the object of state action to the effect on the individual. This is in 1970. That's in R.C. Cooper. Has anybody read R.C. Cooper? Anybody read Manika Gandhi? Ah, please don't read Manika Gandhi. <laughs> read R.C. Cooper. R.C. Cooper. Manika Gandhi is 1978. R.C. Cooper is 1970. R.C. Cooper is uh, by a bench of 11 judges. Manika Gandhi is by 3 judges. Please do not read Manika Gandhi. Manika Gandhi is empty rhetoric. <laughs> the principles of law are written in R.C. Cooper. Read it. It's, it's a fine judgment. It's written in very simple language. Anybody can understand it. And you will get your principles in law right. I find that after Manika Gandhi, everybody who's joined the law school looks only at Manika Gandhi because it's a full rhetoric. It says nothing more than what is already said in 1970, eight years ago, by a bench which is superior strike. And what is more, Manika Gandhi makes for an awful precedent. How was Manika Gandhi decided? <coughs> you read Manika Gandhi. Uh, what was the final outcome of Manika Gandhi's judgment? She got her passport. Right? She got her passport. She got the passport. She was able to travel. How did she get the passport? What was the logic and what was the reasoning of the court? There was no reasoning, don't think about it. <laughs> she got a passport because the central government stand, the attorney general got up and said we are ready to give her a passport. So ultimately it was decided based on a concession by the central government. If that makes good law for you, please go read it. Otherwise, if you want to understand the principles, please read 1970, R.C. Cooper. That is the law. Right? Now look at the parallel developments which I want to flag on um, you know, the, uh, the the development of the law vis-a-vis -vis, uh, administrative law level. So you saw that in the case of fundamental rights, the trajectory that has been taken is this. You go from uh, the uh, silos doctrine to the effects doctrine. That's a fundamental shift. In administrative law, till the, li uh, till the early 90s, what is the principle in administrative law that informs all state action? When, when, you, when you challenge some state action, what is the word that you use? It's some, uh, something in Latin. Ultraviolet. <laughs> what? Ultraviolet. What does it mean? Beyond the powers. So what, the simple thing that you are asking is, <coughs> is the state action beyond the powers conferred on that authority under the statute, right? That was till the 1990s. After the 1990s, there has been a tectonic shift in that also. People started looking not only at, uh, again, you know, you're not looking at the source of the power. You're looking at the effect of the exercise of the power. The source of the power uh, tells you whether that person has got the authority to do it. Right? Now, there is a change. And this change happened in the 1990s because 1996 under the South African uh, the South African constitution, the new constitution came up in South Africa after the apartheid regime and things like that. And there was this brilliant uh, scholar 
uh, who is called Etienne Murenik and he wrote an article, he wrote a, uh, a very good article, sadly he died in a very young age, so shortly thereafter he passed away. But his article talking about the South African Bill of Rights is titled A Bridge to Where? with a question mark. And um, later, in later years, uh, uh, Aparna Chandra, who is a, who's a, uh, a jurist, uh, who is an uh, assistant professor now in Nuals, and not in Nuals, in the uh, National Law School in Bangalore, she has written another art, uh, article, of, you know, borrowing from the same, she says a bridge to nowhere. But Murenik's article says a bridge to where. Right? And what he deals with in the context of the South African Bill of Rights, as he says that there has to be a shift now from a culture of authority to a culture of justification. So you are no longer looking at the authority of the person to do something. You are looking at the justification for that action from the point of view of the individual who is affected by that action. So the citizenry now stands up and asks for every state action which has some consequence on them. Please show me the justification for this action of yours. Now this resonates to a large extent with what is happening with our fundamental rights uh, protection. We are also asking the same question. Now you are looking at it from the point of view of what is happening to my right? How is this affecting me? Similarly, you are asking the same question. Whenever state action comes, you are challenging it and you say, you may have the power, but how do you justify the effect on me? And that's where the entire doctrine of proportionality, the, 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 the rule of proportionality is built. It's built from this fundamental shift in administrative law from gazing at the power, ultra-wise doctrine. It has given way to the larger principles of rule of law. And rule of law principles which now inform every administrative action to ensure that there is actual governance, uh, healthy governance of a society. So you have to now see this action, any state action, affecting the individual. You look at it from the point of view of effect, on fundamental rights, culture of justification. Citizen gets up, demands from the state, you may be having the authority, but how do you justify your action? Okay. So this is uh, as far as the uh, privacy law development is concerned. When it comes to, and this is the last, I promise you, uh, the, uh, the uh, as a student of constitutional law, and you are talking about constitutional interpretation, just look at the trajectory here. I'll just give you some examples. 1950 Gopalan Article 21, pure textual reading. You know what I, uh, what it said. 1951 is Shankari Prasad's case in, um, in the context of Article 368. Challenge to the First Amendment to the Constitution. The constitutional text says 13.2. The Supreme Court judges interpret that by saying that there is a distinction between a constituent power and a constituted power. A constituent power is a power that precedes the constitution. It is what gives birth to the constitution. It is the exercise of the constituent power gives you a constitution. A constituted power is a power that exists because of the constitution. Under the constitution you have a certain bodies, parliament, uh, executive, the judiciary. 368 is an exercise of power by the parliament, but that power is an exercise of constituent power. Article 13.2 they said, which says no law made by the state shall infringe or take away to law made by a constituted power. So here is the uh, uh, you know, catch. They say that when the amendment happened, the amendment was an exercise of the constituent power and therefore it is not hit by Article 13.2. That is not a law that is contemplated under Article 13.2. This was the line. Now this, forget the debate about whether it was right or wrong or uh, misconceived. It's definitely not a literal reading of the text. So in Gopalan you have a literal reading of the text informing the interpretation. Same year, you have Shankari Prasad taking a non-textual interpretation. Right? 1954, 19, let's go to Karak Singh, 1963. 
1963, majority said you don't have privacy in the constitution. The concept of privacy must be founded on order and liberty. At least you have liberty mentioned in the constitution. Subarao, the minority judgment says, forget all this, we have to read in privacy as a fundamental right into Article 21, non textual. 67, Golaknath. Subarao is now the majority. <laughs> what does he do? He restores, in my view, rightly so. He restores the uh, uh, argument with regard to Article 13.2 and he says 13.2 you can talk about constituent, constituted power. Ultimately, an amending law is a law made by parliament. It is no different from the law made by parliament in other areas. If that is so, Article 13.2 says no law made by the state. The state is wider than the parliament. Parliament is only one of the aspects of state. No law made by the state can infringe or take away. Pure textual. Now, textual interpretation by the very same man in, in Golipnath. Not textual when it comes to privacy. And then you have R.C. Cooper in 1970. Again, going on a purely textual understanding of what is that uh, part 3 is not comprised of individual rights, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, they are not individual islands, it's actually a continent. Keshavaranda, 1973. We don't know where they came out with this basic switch, I can say. <laughs> Put it out of a hat. But, and uh, completely non-textual. You don't find basic structure written anywhere in the constitution. So, these areas I think um, are focus for uh, future debate, but coming back to the title, what is the horizon? According to me, it must depend upon uh, future innovations. We don't know what technology is coming up in, in the future. You are going to have new challenges. But one thing you can be rest assured, if the judiciary is going to give any verdict, it is going to be based on a majoritarian view held by people in society. It is not going to be taken it otherwise. This is the uh, sum and substance of what I can analyze or what I have been able to analyze uh, and I hope it has been of some use to all of you here. Thank you. Thank you so much sir. Now I, now I would like to invite Advocate Shyam Kumar sir for his closing remark. Justice Jayashankar Nambriya, Director of the School of Legal Studies, Dr. Pika, Madam Parvati, the Secretary of Indian Law Institute, uh, Advocate Uni Krishnan, members of the Executive Council of the Indian Law Institute, faculty members of the School of Legal Studies, my dear students. I have been interested in the task of uh, making the closing remarks. I can't think of any other better remark than to say that we have seen the academician in justice, uh, Jay Shankar. <laughs> Personally, I should say that I had the occasion to appear against him when he was a senior faculty. I had had the occasion to appear before him as a lawyer many a times. Now I had a wonderful opportunity to hear him as a student and his exposition of the topic that we had decided on. I should say, as Dr. Prida was pointing out, uh, we are sister institutions, the Indian Law Institute as well as the School of Legal Studies. I was a student here 27 years back and I remember Justice Chetur Sangaran Nair coming here and delivering lecture. And Dr. K. Chandrasekhar Pillai who was the director here used to tell us that this is the first institution in India which tried to employ the case study method. And I remember Dr. B.G. James teaching us administrative law exclusively through cases. He would come into the class and give us at least 100 cases on one particular topic and would just walk out. And we are supposed to study each of these cases, come up the propositions therein, just like Justice Nambiar had done at this point of time. So I was just reflecting on 
Justice uh, Nambia's method of uh, conveying to us this particular topic that he was talking on, as well as Justice B.J. James' method of case study method. Incidentally, Cochin University as School of Legal Studies didn't stop there. Justice Nambia was pointing out or mentioning about Justice K.K. Matthew. There is a book by Justice K.K. Matthew which is under the title Three Lectures. That is the only book that he has written, and incidentally, that is a public law lecture <coughs> that was rendered here. Uh, I, think, the uh, I think I'm. Yes. 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 The, uh, the, what he said in uh, Sukhdev Singh, I think I misquoted it. What he said, the exact word were the governing power, wherever located must be informed by constitutional limitations. That's what he said. The governing power, wherever situated or located, must be informed by constitutional limitations, must be subject to constitutional limitations. Sir, I have a question. During the lecture, you mentioned that judiciary should not be ready to the context of part four of the constitution. Sorry? Judiciary should not be ready to the part four of the constitution. The context in law making, rule making, is the power to legislate, the principles which the power to legislate. Article 36 starts with the definitions that under the context otherwise requires. Same shall have the same meaning of part 3. And especially with the judiciary's use in 142, 141, which substantially affects the rights of the persons. Don't you think narration, narration should be revisited? Because there was also a dissent by Indai Tullah in that case. Itself. No, but uh, I was saying that the judiciary, the, the rights, the directive principles of state policy are not judicially enforced. They, they are the so many the, the text says otherwise. But under the context, it is deep. It is deep according to part 4. In part 4, judiciary is deep. Unless otherwise the context requires. Article 36. Yes. No, no. In this part, unless the context otherwise requires, the state has the same meaning as in part 3. Part 3. No, but the. The provisions contained in this part shall not be enforceable by any court. What does that mean? But, sir, there are certain instances where, where for example, the Vishaka judgment, it was ordered in the international law. Vishaka judgment, the guidelines that they adopt. Because there is, that is written in part, part four of the constitution. We should honor international judgments. That's right. So, the judiciary is speaking no. laws. Judiciary can make laws, but is it, don't you think there's a difference between the state and not enforceable by any court? No, not the enforcing the rule making power of the court. And especially the rule making power. For example, article is right. Article in Narish Bulajka there was a discussion. And now it is revisited in the context of part four. Don't you think it should be revisited? I am asking your opinion. I'll tell you my opinion. Uh, article 32. You see the danger is that is this. It's not something that I have not uh, thought about. The danger is this. Um, if you look at article 32 which I keep uh, referring to. It says that state shall not make any law. Right? Now conventionally, you don't bring courts within the meaning of state under part 3, which is where article 13 is. Why is it that we don't bring courts? Mirajkar also said that the court in its administrative capacity becomes a state. It's only the laws or the judgments that are given by the courts that don't come under the concept of state. That's because courts traditionally do not make laws. Right? State, state shall not make law is what Article 32 says. The, the court, judiciary as an organ of government, does not make law. Making law is only by legislature. Now, you have a point when you say that uh, in Mishaka, those guidelines were to operate as law. Till such time as the legislation made laws. Now it's another thing that in our country we act so we act so fast that uh, after the Vishakar guidelines in 1996, the state legislation came after 17 years, 2013, right? So we had this Vishakar guidelines operating as law, and it was made by the court till 2013. And I ask you again as a student. Suppose any of those guidelines were violative of 
Article 14, Article 19. Can, it, can you strike it down? Why not? Can we not, uh, can we not use judicial review of a judgment of the Supreme Court to the extent it has made law? Exactly, exactly. So there can be situations where you will find yourself in a very awkward position where a High Court judge will have now sit in judicial review over a judgment of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so that, there are certain situations which are not contemplated by the Constitution which we are doing. No doubt. But that doesn't mean that you give full effect to everything in the Constitution to you know, nullify it. Because that will be dangerous. And uh, not everything that has to be done by a constitutional functionary is written in the Constitution. Like whether a gov uh, the governor can sit on a bill or you know, whether the president can sit on a bill. These are not matters that are dealt with in the Constitution at all. There are certain conventions which require functionaries to act in a particular way. You are talking about constitutional morality. There is also something called the constitutional discipline. Right? And there, that must inform the functionary. So, uh, the, the interpretation of the constitution, and this is where I say that, you know, don't look to courts to fill in the gaps or the uh, thing. Let that be done by the legislature. Let, let that be debated by parliament. And if you think the constitution is not enough to uh, cater to all your demands, amend the constitution or even rewrite the constitution. What is it? Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much, sir, for that explanation. No, no. <laughs> the fact that uh, Justice Jayashank Nambiar had sparked the interest in the students is revealed by the fact that he even had an interruption into the uh, closing comments. <laughs> and it is very much in, uh, appreciated. And it shows the fact that what we intended in, uh, in by, by coming together, that is, the Indian Law Institute as well as the School of Legal Studies, have materialized. It has worked. And I'm happy to say that this has been a very successful, and I'm sure that we, I, I consider myself as a guest faculty and as a teacher for the last around 20 years, we had substantially much to learn from you, sir, when it comes to keeping the attention of the students for nearly one and a half hours with this and, and making them interact with this. Thank you very much, sir, for that. And we assure you that the Indian Law Institute as well as the School of Legal Studies will come forward with more such uh, interactive sessions, mainly because this is an opportunity for the students also to understand how does a judge's mind work. That is not something that we get to know or the students get to know every day. The law is made. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That was indeed, that was indeed an agenda that we had so that the students would get to know because here we are taught, for example, the 11 students here would know we are taught the judicial process. We are also taught the uh, categories of illusionary references and the 11 categories pointed out by Julius Stone, Professor Julius Stone in his book, as well as the judicial process of Benjamin Nathan Cardoso. So we tried hard as, teach, as lecturers to convince the students that you should try and understand how a judge's mind works and how do students get to know this much more better than in functions like this. And I guess that to a certain extent, it benefits the judges also that what does the student community or the law students or the younger brains think of many of the concepts and I'm sure that that would also influence their thinking process when it comes to laying down or grappling with different concepts that come up before them in the course of time. So I conclude, I thank the School of Legal Studies, especially Dr. Frida for organizing this. I thank all the students who have joined here and uh, have made this discussion very lively and uh, right. I thank the faculty members for being here and uh, I thank again our secretary, uh, Advocate Unnigrishnan, who has been the force, who has been encouraging us all along. Thank you very much.